Our final speaker is against the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. He's the actor, broadcaster and author, Stephen Fry, a bit of an all-rounder really. Stephen can turn his hand to many things, very popular with his legions of fans. Stephen, let's hear your views, see how well you do in the popularity stakes with uh, people in the Vatican. Oh, Occasions, as Gwendolyn remarked in The Importance of Being Earnest, when it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind, it becomes a pleasure. And <laughs> this is one such occasion with my trusty hitch by my side. I am very proud to be here, but also very nervous, very worried. I've been nervous all day, and the reason I've been nervous is quite simple, and that is that this motion matters to me. It matters to me greatly. It's not a joke, it's not a game, it's not just a debate. I genuinely believe that the Catholic Church is not, to put it at its mildest, a force for good in the world. And therefore it is important for me to try and marshal my facts as well I can to explain why I think that. But I want first of all to say that I have no quarrel and no argument and I wish to express no contempt for individual devout and pious members of that church. They are welcome to their sacraments, to their welcome to their reliquaries and to their Blessed Virgin Mary. They're welcome to their, um, to their faith, to the importance they place in it, to the comfort and the joy that they receive from it. All of that is absolutely fine by me. It would be impertinent and wrong of me to express any antagonism towards any individual who wishes to find salvation in whatever form they wish to express it. That to me is sacrosanct as much as any article of faith is sacrosanct to anyone of any church or any faith in the world. It's very important. It's also very important to me, as it happens, um, that I have my own beliefs. Uh, they are a belief in the Enlightenment. They are a belief um, in the eternal adventure of trying to discover moral truth in the world. Discover. It's a terribly important word to which we might return. It's a fight, it's an empirical fight. It's one that was begun in the middle of, uh, of, of the last millennium. Uh, it's given the name the Enlightenment. And there is nothing, sadly, that the Catholic Church and its hierarchs likes to do more than to attack the Enlightenment. It did so at the time. Reference was made to Galileo and the fact that he was tortured for trying to explain the Copernican theory of the universe. That's history. History, as Miss Whittacombe has reminded us, is irrelevant. It's not important. All that matters now is that billions of pounds go out of this extraordinary institution to relieve the poor around the world and make the world a better place. History is of no importance whatsoever. Well, I beg to differ. History, history whinnies and quivers and vibrates in all of us in this hall in this square mile. Let's think about this square mile. I'll come back to it in a moment. But first, Christopher made mention of limbo. It seems so tedious and so silly. One of those little casuistic games that Thomists and others play. Aquinas and Augustine of Hippo both proposed this extraordinary idea that babies who were unbaptized would not know heaven. They also proposed the idea of purgatory, which doesn't exist in the Bible. There's absolutely no evidence for it. However, what an extraordinary, brilliant coup to imagine such a thing as purgatory, that a soul needs to be prayed for in order to go to heaven, in order to turn left when he enters the aeroplane of heaven and get a first-class seat. <laughs> that he needs to be prayed for, and for many hundreds, indeed over a thousand years, you'll be amazed what generous terms those prayers came at sometimes as little or as two-thirds of a year's salary, could ensure that a dead loved one would go to heaven. And money could ensure that your baby, your dead child, your dead uncle, your dead mother, could go to heaven. And if you were rich enough, you could have a chantry built, and monks would permanently sing prayers so that that 
existence in heaven for the child would go up and up and up until they were at the table of the Lord themselves. Now, all this is in the past and is irrelevant. I see to Anne Widdicombe how irrelevant it is, except in one thing. This church is founded on the principle of intercession. Only through the apostolic succession, only through the laying on of hands from this Galilean carpenter, whom we can all admire, only from the laying on of hands to his apostles, to St. Peter, to the other bishops, all the way down to everyone consecrated in this room, anyone ordained here will know they, are, uh, they have this extraordinary power to change the molecules of wine into blood, literally, to change the molecules of paste bread into flesh, literally, and to forgive the sins of the peasants and the poor whom they routinely exploit around the planet. Only this church has this extraordinary principle that it is through these male priests, and only male priests, that this is given. It is a doctrinal fact. It is more than a doctrinal fact. It is a dogma. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. That is a dogma of the church that has been used to excuse all the missionary zeal, all the rape and torture of the Aztecs and the Incas, all the horrors of South America and Africa and the Philippines and the rest of the world, to which other churches and other cultures have also their guilt to admit. It's not unique to the Catholic Church, and I never said it was, and the motion doesn't say it was, or at least the opposition of the motion does not arrogate to the Catholic Church uniquely this sin. However, the particular nature of the exploitation of the poor, the vulnerable, and the young. If I were to talk to a priest now, believe me, that priest would be the most worldly, charming, self-deprecating, snobbish in a Ronald Knox, Alfred Gilby sort of way. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. He would be lovely. He would smoke. Gosh, how daring. <laughs> he would be a sort of ha-ha-ha priest. And uh, the superstition and the nonsense that we read about of the church, it, it's absolute. Don't pay any attention, Stephen. Just join Farm Street or, one, or, or the Brompton Oratory and have a marvelous time as a Catholic, and everything is lovely and splendid. But be poor and ignorant, and my goodness me, every single detail of damnation and original sin and of any possibility of your complaining or asking to think for yourself. I said, let's think of this square mile. Just imagine in this square mile how many people were burned for reading the Bible in English. And one of the principal burners and torturers of those who tried to read the Bible in English here in London was Thomas More. You may know if you've read the novel Wolf Hall, which won the Man Booker Prize just the other day. Now, that's a long time ago, it's not relevant, except that it was only last century that Thomas More was made a saint, and it was only in the year 2000 that the last pope, the Pole, he, he made Thomas More the patron saint of politicians. <laughs> this is a man who put people on the rack for daring to own a Bible in English. He tortured them for owning a Bible in their own language. The idea that the Catholic Church exists to disseminate the word of the Lord is nonsense. It is the only owner of the truth for the billions that it likes to boast about, because those billions are uneducated and poor, as again it likes to boast about. But they are the ones it can tell and bully and domineer. And then we come to children. Well, it's all very well to say the world didn't know better. The world had no knowledge of how dangerous crime, uh, how dangerous a crime child abuse was. I want to read you some of the words of Ratzinger, the current pope. Staggers me to admit that he is the head of state of a country. Incidentally, Anne Widdicombe said, we didn't have the power of a nation state. Yes, you do. You are a nation state. Yes, I wrote it down, you mentioned that. You are a nation state, and it is no accident that the Cairo, the UN Cairo Population Conference, when they were trying to do something about the world's population spinning out of control, 
Vatican City, as a nation state represented at that conference, made a joint statement with the Islamic countries of the world, notably the most extreme Islamic countries of the world, led by Saudi Arabia, and it, it began, on behalf of the revealed religions of the world, dot, 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 and what it did was essentially hobble and veto any possibility of women's sexual freedom in the world, because as we know, the Islamic religion and the Catholic Church have never been anything other than implacably opposed to women's choice in their own bodies and their destinies. <laughs> However, <laughs>